Hello, my name is Aramel, and I'm joined today by the creative directors of Super Studio, Susan and Wei. And, and we um, are like to welcome Kieran Wong, who will be delivering a talk for Super Studio. So I'll let Kieran introduce himself. Hi, and uh, thanks for inviting me along. So my name um, is Kieran Wong. I'm a partner at the Fulcrum Agency. And uh, I'm very pleased to be having a chat to you. And I'm sorry that I can't do it live. I'm, when this is recorded, I will be in Hobart um, and on holidays. <laughs> so I uh, couldn't join you live. But what I'm going to do now is just share my screen and then we can get started, if that's OK. Of course. OK. Uh, Close that. Um, if I go into full screen mode, are you still seeing the screen or have you lost it? Uh, it's not full screen. Uh, but we oh, still okay. Screen, yeah. Uh, let me try. Okay, well, we'll just leave it like this then. That's fine. Sure. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, something in relationship to the theme of the conference or the, or the super studio this year around identity and in particular the way that our practice has started to um, rethink that our role um, working in a particular space and in this context I'm going to talk a little bit around the work we do uh, in some remote communities um, uh, for community housing and infrastructure. So um, just Kaya, which is to say hello. Um, I'm currently sitting in Walia, which is um, on Wajak country um, of the Noongar Nation. And um, it's a beautiful part of the world. If you've ever been to Fremantle, um, you know why I choose to live and work here. It's pretty fantastic. Um, so this is a picture actually of Fremantle Harbour and there's the working port and my house is in here somewhere and the office where I'm sitting now is over here somewhere. So a very small life. Um, my family is from uh, this area and my, um, uh, I guess on my mother's side were uh, waterside workers that worked in the port for many generations. And in fact, my cousins still do. Um, and my father um, migrated here from Malaysia in uh, the late sixties and met my mother um, when they were studying to be school teachers here. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I guess I have a kind of strong connection to this place here in Fremantle. Um, we work as an agency all over the place. This is a kind of current snapshot of projects that are live in our office right now. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of work that we do within um, Perth, I guess, and also um, in Sydney. Uh, where we have uh, another office, but a lot of the work from those offices is actually spread back out into lots of different parts of Australia. In fact, there should be another dot just here in the middle of Alice Springs because we're just about to start some uh, work there again. But um, so I need to update this map. But you can see that there is, I, I guess, quite a lot of connections between um, the uh, the bottom of West of Australia and the kind of northern half, and we tend to work a lot. Uh, in some pretty remote locations um, as well. In particular at the moment in the Western Desert, we're doing quite a lot of work. Uh, this is a team, it's a small team. Um, and uh, this is a photo that when we all had to you know, have showers and get scrubbed up. Um, but the, we used to have a practice called CODA. And in fact, a lot of those people who were in that previous image were in CODA. Um, and then sort of joined us in this new venture. And one of the things that we had in CODA was this notion that architects need to become quite stealthy, that we have to almost be invisible um, in the process or, or somehow sneak into the design process. Um, because as soon as you let it be known that you are an architect, there is a kind of um, box that you're put into immediately by clients or people and consultants or, you know, whoever, who immediately are thinking this person wants to design a building and, um, you know, uh, their kind of role is a particular role. And I guess what we tried to do with CODA, and we use this image quite a lot, 
was to think about ways in which we could kind of move upstream through the decision-making process and get closer to the heart of where projects are born um, in a way. And uh, so we were, the, we were trying to be the wolf in that sense in sheep's clothing, getting up to the juicy lamb. Um, and I think that worked for a little while. That worked for us at Coda for you know, almost two decades. Um, but the new business that we have now, um, I guess the full permit agency, we, was an opportunity to kind of rethink some of those things. And I won't drill into all of these things in particular, but one of the kind of key um, components, I suppose, of the change in which we thought about the practice um, was this move from design to strategy and from studio to agency. And where we often think about things like community engagement um, or consultation to move towards more genuine co-design and co-production, which is to say that we support um, communities to do the kind of projects they want to be able to do as opposed to coming in with a project that's been predetermined from the outside. So this, this, in a sense, probably started the way we thought about the agency and we've only been really running for two years. So um, we're a pretty new business in some respects, but um, I guess lucky to have brought quite a lot of experience from Coda um, previously. So I'm just gonna just show you a couple of the components that relate to the work, in particular to this super studio idea around identity. So the, a lot of the work we do in the agency is to do with thinking about stronger ways which we can connect to community and actually have an evidence-based um, understanding of the things that we do. So we partner a lot with universities, we partner through things like ARC grants um, uh, and through um, incubators, for example, at the University of Sydney um, on projects that relate specifically to our areas of interest. Um, we also produce um, material to try and think, we use this diagram, the kind of old way, new way diagram when we're working in community of what processes, um, and I'll come back to that diagram later in the talk, but what processes we, we need to be able to utilise um, when we're rethinking ways of delivering projects. We've developed a kind of social return on design investment tool that we're currently trialling um, in a number of communities in the Territory to look at um, the process of design, the value of design in communities and ways in which design itself can actually support culture and by that, can we generate a kind of, um, in a sense, an understanding of the value of culture um, that's being protected or enhanced or, or sustained through design? Um, so there's some of the research components that we, um, we start to use. We publish some of this work. We have a journal that we publish um, uh, pretty regularly. And um, so that, that's a really key part of the kind of work that we do at the moment. And again, I know a lot of practices will do research, and, um, but we, we try to think of ways in which that kind of pure research can be applied, um, you know, in particular through university settings. The other thing that we do a lot is this notion of engagement, and it's kind of a strange word. Um, it's kind of an odd one. This is the kind of classic image of what, when people talk about engagement, what they think we mean which is really where we sit down and we have conversations with people. There is a process by which the design iteration, the briefing, the kind of, in a sense, the feedback loops are somehow closed um, with communities. I guess what we have started to realise, and interestingly, Andrew, who's a principal in Sydney, and I wrote a piece on this called Bush Mechanics um, not too long ago, is that there's actually a lot of processes now around engagement, which kind of look like their engagement, but they're really a kind of smokescreen to the notion of um, public participation. It's a kind of, it's as if there's a democratic process, but it's not actually doing the real thing. Um, and so we tend to work in this model, which is, um, you know, the essay that I mentioned, Bush Mechanics, this is a kind of classic image of um, uh, that TV show. If you've never seen the show, Google it, find it. It's fantastic. Um, and which is to say that we use tools at hand to develop different ideas at different times, depending on the situation. And so we don't ever come in with a kind of standard set of ideas. And we're very open to kind of having to quickly and um, um, radically change approaches to get from A to B. Um, so that, that kind of 
this notion Kim Mahout talks about this, which is that I think we started the agency and probably had through CODA a desire to kind of help communities or come in with design solutions. Um, and uh, often what we found was that we were coming in, in a sense, <coughs> um, the kind of term is often used as seagulls, you know, big white squawky things that come in, shit on everything and then leave. Um, that's the kind of notion that, um, uh, that you see a lot in these communities. And actually, I think the, the primary element that we've been working on um, in the last year, I suppose, or so, is this notion that we're not coming to help um, we're not coming to fix. We're actually coming to, in a sense, learn and the opportunity to learn something about our country and the way in which the country is formed is really important. And that's a really hard thing to do as an architect who was trained as an architect, whose training was kind of delivered through a pretty classical Beaux-Arts model that hasn't really changed in architecture school since, I don't know when, the Beaux-Arts um, uh, period, um, uh, to unlearn some of those um, I guess processes and in a sense a little bit of the arrogance that we have design solutions for everything if we just can try hard enough. We still do work in the built environment. We're sort of working in that space less and less and we tend to work in the built environment in a way um, which is more kind of holistic and may bring in lots of different players and we're less interested in potentially the kind of final object per se. And we tend to frame our work in the built environment and not in architecture. If you go to our website, we don't say architecture anywhere or um, any of those sorts of things, but we talk about the notion of the environment that's built around us as opposed to a, say, a natural landscape. Um, and so that means that we can pick up things like streets, footpaths, parks, community infrastructure, sewerage infrastructure, everything that's built in the environment, we tend to want to understand and work with. So we have worked to very, um, I guess, closely with the community up in a place called Groot Island. Um, it's an, it's um, the group Anadiliakwa, are the um, Aboriginal language group. And we've worked with those guys for probably six or seven years now on a range of projects of infrastructure, thinking about different ways in which, um, in particular things um, such as kinship structure, cultural obligation, avoidance, relationship mapping, et cetera, work in, in housing um, and in their um, subdivision um, settlement patterns. So we have developed, you know, these are a series as an example of one of the houses that we've done. We've done a number of different house um, typologies and the, the idea of the housing typologies is that they're kind of flexible within a certain system. So that's nothing kind of radically new, but the, I guess where we kind of see that value of what we would call radical incrementalism is that there's a kind of incremental movement towards um, the community having their own housing company, which is, was established a few years ago, um, to being able to take control of the entire process of this housing design and housing delivery, which is starting to occur now. Um, and I guess the slightly depressing thing about working in this space is that it's all been done um, many, many times before. So what we tend to see, um, this is what's called the um, UPK report, which was done, which was the precursor to a group called Health Habitat. Um, and uh, it was done back in 1987. It was looking at, um, uh, in a sense, on the APY lands, um, housing and health. And there was an architect called Paul Follerus that, worked on this project back in 87 uh, and then led a team and, and you know we've been working um, at the moment this is an image from a place called Gunawaraji out in the western desert where we're working at the moment um, and in fact that guy in the blue shirt Brad is out in the Pilbara today um, and uh, you know since 87 has there been a radical kind of um, improvement in the way in which either housing is delivered or infrastructure is delivered and the answer is no unfortunately so um it's it's kind of a tough cycle in some respects to be working in um and this notion of this kind of repeating cycle of failure is one in which we tend to operate unfortunately quite a lot and looking for ways to break out of that cycle is is in a sense the key part of our work so how do we break out of that cycle um, is probably um, the part which excites me the most um, 
drives us the most. A lot of the work that we do now is trying to rethink the, the approach to the delivery of projects or our role in the delivery of projects and connecting with communities in kind of radically different ways. This is an image um, of sand drawings by Tyson Yonker Porter um, and his book Sand Talk is a fantastic book. If you haven't read it, you should read it immediately. <laughs> Um, but it's a really great book in terms of trying to describe Indigenous spatial knowledge, Indigenous knowledge systems, um, even just thinking um, just the way in which um, the notion of drawing, and this is why it's of particular interest, I think, to people like yourselves, of drawing and talking and building stories through drawing. In this case, these are sand drawings. Um, which became carvings, which became chapters in the book, um, can kind of build connections um, and also allow for, in a sense, what Tyson calls um, aggregate stories, where we're not looking for a kind of singular moment of refined truth. Uh, I think architects are often kind of keen to take com complexity and contradiction and all sorts of things and funnel them down through a process until they become this kind of single beautiful idea that can be described and somehow contained within that idea is all of this kind of information and you know through a process of design you've refined it to this one point i think the notion that tyson talks about around aggregating stories and the, and the kind of complexity of what we would call nowadays yarning you know talking and building stories is that opposite points of view discordant kind of notions of um space or time or or politics uh, or identity can all be captured in these things and built upon and contained and always present. And so that complexity is always present. And I think that for us is something which is a kind of key part of, if I go back to this notion of unlearning, um, one of the things we're trying to do. So this is kind of a diagram of our process. <laughs> this is our thinking model uh, where, uh, you know, sometimes there's an outcome in here, but it's a little bit hazy how do we get there. Sometimes we take trajectories which really don't even go near the outcome and take us off the page somewhere and we end up somewhere completely different. Sometimes they stop and start and don't seem to do anything at all and you might call them complete failure. I think this is a kind of interesting notion when we try and think about how we work and think a little bit. And it's not dissimilar, um, I suppose, in, in, in many respects to the ways, I mean, I'm not talking, I'm certainly not suggesting that our thinking is as complex as this, but um, it's not dissimilar to the ways in which Indigenous knowledge often talks to this notion of what um, anthropologists would call some companies, these long connections sp between space, time, people, um, biodiversity, flora, fauna, seasons. These are things which, although they might be able to be mapped in this case by an anthropologist, um, are things which are constantly changing and evolving and building. Um, and so these are some companies uh, in the place where we work at the moment in Grid Island. Um, uh, so they're connecting from the island back to the mainland and making connections in effect um, be, at a, from a time when in fact the mainland was connected to the island. I mean, these are the things that the, the, the stories that are built and the song line and song companies that are built kind of travel through time in a way that we, we sort of struggle to comprehend sometimes. And so I guess this is, um, this is an uh, image of a string game, which is a very common um, Indigenous string game from um, uh, uh, Arnhem Land. And, um, uh, you know, this idea somehow of bringing these kind of interconnected stories together and being able to hold parts of it in your hand and describe it. And at the same time, as soon as your hand stops moving, the pattern disappears. I find these kinds of notions of strategy telling, storytelling quite beautiful. So I guess the final slide really is just, this is an image, this is a painting um, that we bought from a guy called Jackie Green. Um, he, he lives just um, near Borulula, um, which has been in the news recently. It's always in the news because of the um, Ranger mine and um, the problems with water. But um, often, there is a kind of sense of working in a place which is about the kind of beauty of country. Um, and I think, you know, for us, it's a big challenge trying to tie together the tension between the destruction of 
places in Australia through mining and farming um, and the kind of connection to culture and that kind of constant value proposition, which one's more valuable within the kind of contemporary Australian society. I think we saw that at places like Duke and Gorge, we're currently seeing it um, in native title claims in places like um, Roper uh, against the Ranger Mine, um, which is where um, Jackie's from. Um, and we sit with this challenge all the time as um, professionals because in a sense, so much of our funding, whether it comes directly or generally fairly indirectly comes as a result of mining. <laughs> and so um, there is this sort of constant conversation that we have with ourselves about the value of the work that we do, how can we do it ethically, what's our kind of moral obligation to respecting country. Um, yeah, and so this is, this is a painting that hangs in our office and kind of tries to keep us in line every now and then. Whenever I go to the kitchen to make coffee, I have to walk past it. Um, <laughs> so I, I use it to kind of keep me in line somewhat. So we started the process of the agency with a kind of clear set of ideas. I put this list together um, of where I think we're at now. And, <laughs> and um, in a way, I probably would say, or I definitely would say, I know less about what I do now than I did two years ago when, I st when we started the agency. And I certainly know less and feel less expert than I did when I graduated many, many moons ago. So from, from where we are now, we're at a kind of point where we're, we're trying to make, you know, something from nothing. We're trying to move from sometimes nothing to something. What we find ourselves often is in a place of working between nothing and nothing. Um, and we're always hopeful, I guess, that something will lead to the next thing. Um, that's a sort of terribly unpoetic way of saying that the practice itself is, and the agency itself is still in a sense looking for its own identity. Um, uh, and that's something that is a very interesting journey to be on. So maybe we're more like, less like the um, wolf in sheep's clothing and more like the dingo coming into camp looking for a sausage. We're a bit more out in the open now and uh, um, a bit more comfortable in our own skin. Thank you. All right, thank you, Karen, for the um, excellent presentation. And really, you, you highlighted, um, you know, the progress of your organization. And you're saying, it's like, you mentioned about your organization's own identity. And so it's good to see, you know, your evolution, the way you're thinking, as well as um, you also showed your process, too, um, which I think will be valuable for your student um, participants. So we'll move into the Q&A. Um, so I'll let the creative directors um, ask their questions. So we'll start with Susan. Thank you very much, Aramo, and thank you, Kieran. I really enjoyed that um, that talk by you. It's certainly many. In fact, all all of what you spoke about resonated deeply with me and my own work and my own journey. So it's very easy to uh, connect with what you were saying at all times. I think it's um, we're very, very uh, privileged to have you be part of this speaker series for Super Studios uh, theme of evolving identity, because in all of that storytelling that you just shared with us, the, the theme of evolving identity was threaded right through and it wasn't an invisible thread. It was very, very remarkable, a remarkable thread. And it's almost um, you know, a standout in this, in this context because not many, not many Australian practices, whether old or new or contemporary, actually are in the space that you are in. So um, I think it's really refreshing to, to have you uh, share that, that, that journey with us, Kieran. I guess out of all the, I was going to ask you a preemptive question out of all that, that um, you know, um, all that embodying and embedding of identity in your work, whether there was a special lesson you had learned, but that was before you ended with the fact that you, you now know less than you started with. <laughs> I think that's just being um, awfully humble of yourself. Um, as we know, we all learn I think it's diabolical, yeah. We feel like we don't know a lot. We don't know anything, but at the same time, we've learned a lot. We've collected a lot of things. So in your, in your kit of things that you have collected along the way, 
what is a you know something that that's remarkable or special that you will um, probably never ever you know forget. Yeah. It, look, um, in some ways, it's um, what's interesting. I think is that at uh, um, when we started the practice and when I was at university, so that was um, a long time ago in the early nineties. Uh, the it, it was a sort of a um, an interesting Perth was an interesting place at that time, and I think one thing that um, and it, I guess just to come back to a kind of identity position and then talk a little bit around myself, you know, if I talk directly about you know my personal um, self, um, one thing that I've been really reflecting on, I guess, since we've been working in the agency and working a lot in community, is that whenever we work in community, the first part of every meeting, conversation, interaction with people, if we meet them for the first time, or meet them for the first time, there's always quite a bit of a conversation around where you're from, what your family does, who your family are, where they come from, what they did. There is, in, in particular in Aboriginal kinship systems, um, there's a real requirement to be able to explain a pathway back and it's almost an ancestral pathway back to who you are. And in contemporary Aboriginal Australia, one of the challenges is there was so much movement through things like the stolen generation, through dispossession of lands, through displacement of people onto reserves and town camps and those sorts of things. And so there's a, there is this real... Um, hunger, or it's not probably not even hunger is the right word, but real desire and importance in being able to explain where you come from, right, who your family is. And for me, when I was growing up, that was a kind of quite a different situation. My father, um, who's Chinese, um, didn't, you know, in the 60s, that was not a thing. Being Chinese in Australia or in Perth was, um, it was kind of downplayed as much as possible. I suppose, and my childhood, um, you know, and my connection in a sense to that culture was quite, um, you know, I guess the, the, the model at the time was around assimilation as opposed to or full integration as opposed to sort of maintaining identity. Um, and I think that um, in the last few years, I mean, you know, for a while now, I suppose, but in particular when working in community, being able to read like almost to be able to kind of reconnect to some of that stuff for me in terms of Chinese heritage has been a really interesting lesson to learn because of the value that is placed upon it to, under, to position myself in communities. Um, and it's also something that I think is somehow only relatively recent in architectural discourse, like this kind of thought that Australia is part of Asia. That was just not even a consideration when I was trained, you know, like, it was just not there. We were kind of connected to Europe and to North America in a kind of architectural lineage and all of the kind of, all of the mentors and, you know, stars of architecture were European or, you know, North American at the time. And, I mean, even this conversation, like to have four Asian faces on a screen, I mean, it's a kind of, it's not common. It wasn't, it was just totally uncommon. And... Um, so I think for me, the kind of there's it's been odd because working in Indigenous communities a lot has kind of opened me up to being much more connected back to a, to my own identity. Anyway, I'm not sure that I answered your question actually, but um, you know that it struck me as one one thing I didn't talk about in the talk, I suppose. Um, but yeah, yeah. I think you most definitely did, and it's also going to be something that. Maybe that's what you, in a way, in a sense, you did answer the question because that was the one thing that you did find. Yeah. Um, and that was the thing that maybe was always there with you, but you, you know, it just didn't make itself um, pronounced as much. But through your journey, that has become more prominent with you. And that's now something that you will always have with you. Um, yeah. Well, at least you're more aware of it. Um, so I think you definitely answered the question. But I right. won't be. I won't hog the thing, and I'll pass it on to Wei. Oh, thanks, Susan. Um, thanks, Kieran, for joining in. I think you know, your talk is probably very valuable for students when they are thinking about uh, what does practice mean. 
and practice not just in the professional sense, but more importantly, a practice as, a, as an individual. The part of the beauty about practice is that we literally practice with curiosity till we die. Once we stop practicing, we are not evolving. So uh, sharing your ideas and your process and way of representations is definitely valuable because you are dealing with different you know, scenarios, different situations, and through them, come out with ways of communication. And I think I'm helping the students by asking the question about, you know, what will your advice be for the students uh, when it comes to finding their own thoughts, uh, whether in practice, in terms of their processes, or in practice through representation, uh, how would they uh, know, uh, find their way through, especially with such a short uh, exercise of less than a week, needing to come up and address uh, and in fact be confronted by a complex brief, how do they manage their ideas and in fact be adventurous while representing their proposition? Mm. Yeah, well, that's, that's the secret sauce, right? Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, Meg, look, I think what's interesting, I think, um, and I, I have um, children and my, my oldest is 19 and she uh, has just started at university. So... Um, I think this the generation with like that my daughter is in, um, and I'm assuming some of the you know the, the students in this exercise are in. You know, are, are very much more aware of their identity and very much more embracing of it um, than we ever were. Well, than I ever was. I won't say we. I'll say with I. That I ever was. Um, and so I think that the, the critical thing in a project like this, because it is a challenging brief, and one of the challenges of the brief, I think, is that on the one hand, it is asking you to consider a sort of um, an approach to a particular stream of identity, Indigenous, migrant, colonial, settler, or whatever. And, and I would say it's very difficult to pull apart any of those, really. We work across all of those in a way. Um, and, and certainly in my life you know like my father you know moved here as first generation in his family to move to Australia as a kind of migrant and my mother had come from a kind of a longer lineage of people you know um, who'd been who'd come out with you know looking for gold from Ireland um, and then we work with Indigenous culture so I get to kind of sit in this sort of intersection in a way um, of all of those three stories of, of contemporary Australia um, I think the, the key is that you need to be kind of secure in a way in your own identity to approach some of those topics. And I think that um, you, you can't try to, in a sense, second guess your own position on things is what I would suggest. Um, and and the, I see a lot, in particular, we work with a lot of people who are working for the first time um, uh, with Indigenous communities, First Nations communities, and there's a lot of trepidation and a lot of kind of imagining what that is like, you know, that the people have read, I don't know, they've read Dark Emu and they're suddenly trying to work out what to do and, and there's a sense of almost trepidation about engaging. And in, in my experience, it's much better to come, and that was certainly my, um, that was certainly my um, approach too early on. But I think it's much better just to, Come as you are and to have a strong sense of your own self. And that's what I mean by thinking one of the things about being able to say, you know, where do I come from? What is my lineage? What does that mean? I, the one, how does that change the way I think about the world, right? What is it? Do I understand my own biases as a result of that? You know, is, is there something around that that and in a way, I would say that the starting point for this brief is almost to kind of interrogate it as if you are the client as opposed to you are the designer. Because I think what we tend to do as designers is to sort of build barriers between our own sense of personal identity uh, and, and, the, and the kind of client group, user group, stakeholder, whatever you want to call it, community that we're working for. And we do that because we're, op we're operating like professionals and we have to sort of have this kind of distance to be able to do it correctly somehow. And I think 
a brief like this almost demands that you take those, push the barriers down and kind of move into that space of imagining yourself as the client. What does that sense of identity drive out of a project? Um, I think that's probably the way I do it. I spend a little bit of time just being very clear about my own personal sense of this project, what I think that might mean, what stories in my family history might be brought to bear on a, on a kind of brief of this kind. Um, and maybe it's actually a, an opportunity to have conversations with your family that you haven't had before, I don't know, and think about ways in which you can bring that personal story to bear on the brief. That's a beautiful advice, uh, thank you. And you know, at the end of the day is, uh, what is your story? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I was going to say that, uh, Kieran, I think you are definitely showing your wolf there because <laughs> I think you've nailed, you've nailed the brief in, in one, you know, 10 minutes um, because the, the premise of the brief, um, you know, having been the, the creative team creating the brief, the premise of the brief is actually asking the question of where, is, where and what is that starting point? And um, very often, if one doesn't um, know where that starting point is, one has to fabricate a starting point. So yeah. then if you fabricate the starting point, then all of a sudden there's, you know, the lack of authenticity there with that, with that starting point uh, in the approach of uh, whatever the challenge may be. Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, there is, and that's, that's what I mean by those kind of barriers, there's a kind of a distance that's a, a immediately applied as soon as you say, oh, the person I'm working for, I imagine to be over there, you know, um, who's different to me and, you know, the differences become the barrier. So I think, you know, uh, you know, we use it on our website, but Noel Pearson talks about the kind of three stories that make Australia, you know, and which is in a sense your brief, the kind of um, Indigenous story, the colonial settler story and the migrant story. And those three stories make up what we have, you know, today. And I think, I mean, what's interesting is the Indigenous story is also a story of, um, of um, connection to other cultures. I mean, the place where I showed in my slide show of Groot Island, you know, there was considerable trade with the Macassans um, through all of that archipelago region, you know, south of Indonesia and, and into, um, into the top of, of, of Australia. And, you know, I, I worked in a community there, um, uh, a very small sort of um, family, you know, um, settlement. And the senior elder um, um, who was there, who's now um, um, sadly passed away, but um, he, he looked like he could have come, he, he was born and bred in Bali, Right, mm. uh, and he's I don't know how many generations of Anandili Aquaman, but this kind of strong connection of trade that occurred and, and kind of crossing borders, and in a way, the Australian story is a story of um, sorry, the Indigenous Australian story is a story of connection as well, because you're talking about 500 or so different nations that all traded and moved and did things together, and so it's not one singular story. There isn't kind of an Indigenous story or a migrant story, they're all individual stories. There's thousands of those stories. And I think it's important that students in, in this particular process, given the short time scale, I think there's an opportunity to really think about well, what is your story to this brief? That, that I think would be really powerful. Great, well, Karen, with you know, an excellent presentation, you brought to the table a valuable discussion which is just really good. So unfortunately, that's all the time that we have uh, on, the, no on behalf of the Australian Institute of Architects, Sona and the creative team uh, for Super Studio. We'd just like to say thank you for your time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.